course of my work, which takes me to just about every corner of the globe, I see many aspects of a phenomenon which I'm just beginning to understand. Our modern technology has achieved a degree of sophistication beyond our wildest dreams, but this technology has exacted a pretty heavy price. We live in an age of anxiety, a time of stress, and with all our sophistication, we are, in fact, the victims of our own technological strength. We are the victims of shock, of future shock. sickness which comes from too much change in too short a time. It's the feeling that nothing is permanent anymore. It's the reaction to changes that happen so fast that we can't absorb them. It's the premature arrival of the future. And for those who are unprepared, its effects can be pretty devastating. This is a friend's country house. Like myself, they're always on the move, so this retreat of theirs is mine for a while. You know, comfortable homes like old friends give us a sense of security, the feeling that some things at least stay the same. It's a feeling we need very much in this changing world. Every day we're bombarded by choices. We need to make instant decisions. We're in endless combat with our own environment, with all its pace and variety, it's choice and over-choice. What do we buy? Where do we go? What should we think? The make, the model, the price, the pitchman's plea. Buy now. Keep up with the latest. Don't fall behind. The pre-cooked, pre-packaged, plastic-wrapped, instant society. We're faced with so many choices, so many decisions, we have to make them so quickly. None of us can escape the pressures. That's what future shock is all about. Don't fall behind. Keep up with the latest. Buy now. Technology feeds on knowledge, and knowledge expands at a phenomenal rate. Throughout the world, more than a thousand books are published every day. Over 30,000 a month, 365,000 a year. A chemistry professor recently stated that he couldn't pass today's examinations because at least two thirds of the questions require knowledge that didn't even exist when he graduated from Oxford in the early 30s. This machine makes our lives move faster. Computers combine facts to make new knowledge at such high speed that we cannot absorb it. They affect not just the things we buy or the things we know, but the things we do. In the past, art was created for permanence. Today, instant art, fast, computer created. Combinations which are changeable and for the moment, beautiful.
as old knowledge is replaced by new and the pace of change accelerates, the young among us know of no other world. Today's little girl is learning a fundamental lesson. Man's relationship to things is increasingly temporary. Miss, can I get a new doll? You want to trade her in? Yes. Okay, I think we can give you a dollar on that. Okay. Do you know which dollar you want? Yes. Yeah. She says, Mama. May I have uh, 80 cents more, thank you. Even friends don't last. An early lesson in disposability. Nothing is permanent anymore. As we move toward a world of impermanence, buildings once made to last a lifetime are torn down. is built must be easily dismantled, moved, adapted to momentary needs, temporary structures for an impermanent way of life, symbols of a transient society. The plugged in, clipped on, modular architecture of a society on the move. Every year, some 36 million Americans strip their homes and move on, tearing apart communities, families, and individuals, creating future shock. This is the last time I'll move, ever. Moving on, but where are we going? telephone directory is rewritten every day in an effort to keep track of the mobile society. Pages printed out by the computer, additions, deletions, names, addresses, numbers. The rate of change reflecting the fact that where we live means less and less as we breed a new race of nomads. Few suspect how massive, widespread and uprooting these migrations are. Travelers to places never seen The road is there Will I find well, Just to get a block away to make all the difference in the world generation reared on high-speed change. Unlike their parents who settled in one place with one set of relatives and friends, young people are on the move. Home is a place to leave. I don't know what I'm like the, the beautiful thing about uh, traveling around the country <clears throat> or over a large area is that uh, you get to meet so many different people in different situations, you know, and like share experiences. I hang around airports just to like the feel of getting away. And I just like the feeling of getting away. Getting away from like school and work and, you know, my parents. Freedom. The loss of a sense of belonging. On the coast of Spain. On a Danish beach. Temporary encounters. Just as things and places flow through our lives at high speed, so do people. Long-term commitments are not expected. Involvements are compressed in time. 
young people embrace new values in an atmosphere of instant intimacy. Everyone craves human warmth and closeness, especially today when relationships seem to be more and more temporary. What we're witnessing, of course, is the death of permanence. A new society is being created around us, built from the broken pieces of today. And those who people that society are going to live in a very different world. Future shock results from too much change in too short a time. Disposability of products and people. Thousands of people are alive today only because they carry inside them electronic devices, plastic parts, transplanted organs. On October 26, 1968, Carl Schaefer had eight hours to live. A heart transplant extended his life and he symbolizes the era of the disposable body. Dr. Samuel Kunz, eminent among transplant researchers and surgeons. To show you the uh, progress that is being made in transplantation, in 1962, I was involved with a transplant program, and the one-year success rate was about 20%, using living-related donors. Four years ago, the success rate had increased to about 70%. And at the present time, using living-related donors and kidney transplantation, the success rate is virtually 90%. There is an alternative, however, and that is the use of artificial organs. And kidney transplantation, to a large extent, is made possible by the use of the artificial kidney. And I'm sure that an artificial heart will be developed. Temporary body parts products of bioengineering with the ultimate potential of building modular bodies, much as we now build modular homes. Right. Research prosthetist John Bray. I'm holding in my hand a, a prosthetic device for a below the elbow amputation. And uh, uh, this is a, a very highly sophisticated unit. It has uh, electronic device uh, controlled uh, uh, through energy of the energy cells. And um, by placing the transducers over the musculature, we are able to send uh, uh, messages through the electronic system, which operates the, the hand. In effect, it's actually responding to the motor control uh, of the patient who wears it. In fact, at this time, there is hardly any part of the human body, and especially in the extremities, that we cannot replace. An artificial elbow, one more step toward an artificial man. Joints, bones, sockets, sometimes better than the original. Replacing inner bones as plastic surgery replaces the outer skin. All stepping stones toward the temporary person. On March 17th, 1969, Mrs. Verlin Cobb at age 53, was prematurely wrinkled and weathered. On that day, she underwent rejuvenation surgery under plastic surgeon Dr. Kurt Wagner. Even faces are temporary. I really can't uh, imagine what I'm gonna look like because I've been told that I will look a lot different, that I won't have the wrinkles and I will look at least 15 years younger. And as far as I'm concerned, 10 years be thrilled. It's hard to realize that I have got the different face. It's very hard to realize because you know it's only been 12 weeks. But uh, it's still, when I make up or I go dress up and I'm walking down the street, I walk with my head up high. Franz, how are you doing? Even more dramatic changes in the body. Skin color. Dr. William Epstein's work raises the prospect of manipulating race. You're okay. Uh, in these laboratories, we're interested in the factors that determine skin pigmentation. Uh, the question comes up, could we change man's color? And the answer is probably we could and we'll be able to in the future. If we could control the code, we should be able to uh, make a person any color we want, very much like a fish. But really, do you really want to do that? Uh, why don't you just uh, go to the store, get some cosmetics, uh, put yourself on any color you want, any time, 
and be anybody you want. Uh, start a fad. Will the human race emerge in a range of brilliant colors? Given the choice, would we want to look alike or different? What is beautiful? What happens to race? Step by step, the body parts grow disposable, like products we use and discard. This quaint English village, a remnant of permanence in a future shocked world, is the home of neurophysiologist Gray Walter. He's one of the many scientists leading us toward the ultimate replacement, artificial intelligence. 25 years ago, he pioneered the development of behavior machines. This looks rather as though it was a child's toy, and I suppose it might be, but in fact it's rather a serious model of my ideas of behavior. And it behaves in a complex way, with all kinds of behavior modes, only having two elements, compared with our 10 billion in our brains, but this behavior is surprisingly complex. Now, you can see it hesitating a moment, and then avoiding that obstacle, and finding its way slowly and by a rather devious path right into its hut down here. And so, rather like us, it has a sense of priorities, although it's such a very simple toy, but not really just a toy, a model of behavior. Descendants of creatures like those of Dr. Walter. Machines like these can see, hear, touch, smell. They can solve problems that would normally require human intelligence. Like simple living organisms, they respond to changes around them and act accordingly. We might one day duplicate man, his form, his body, his actions and reactions, carefully engineered for lifelike appearance. A diaphragm. A chest. A simulated breathing human being. This is SIM-1, developed for the training of anesthesiologists. It's a machine, a breathing, functioning, computerized patient. As the pace of technology accelerates, as the pieces are laid into place, the pattern seems clear. We might create an artificial man. As work proceeds on the brain, it may someday be possible to combine all the elements into a lifelike duplication of flesh and blood. The momentum is established, but the direction is up to us. Is there danger in the path we are taking? What happens to the definition of man? Who is he? What is he? Imagine the novel sensation of trying to determine whether the smiling courteous humanoid behind the airline ticket counter is a pretty girl or a transistorized robot. Your flight 21 to Dallas has been confirmed. Departure 2.30, arrival Dallas time 4.36. Boarding, gate 17A. Have a nice flight. into a future shocked world in which machines and science cause changes that shatter basic institutions like church, school, family, a world in which nothing endures, not even motherhood. Dr. Charles Epstein researches the birth process. At the present time, it's possible for us to take mouse eggs, to fertilize them in the test tube, to reimplant them, and to have the birth of a normal animal, an animal which is capable of breeding and reproducing its own kind. While these things have been going on in the mice for quite a while, uh, attempts have also been made and are now being made to do similar things with human eggs, to fertilize them in the test tube and to put them back into 
mothers, hopefully to lead to the delivery of a normal child. But of course all this raises very real questions. Assuming that a child so conceived would be born normal, there are of course the legal questions of who the parents would really be. But as far as I'm concerned, the overriding question is whether we as scientists should become involved with and should intervene in a process which is so fundamental to human survival. Baby shopping. Imagine being able to program the IQ of a baby to preset its sex, color, height, and other characteristics. Baby Torians, genetic supermarkets of the future, changing the very structure of the family. The family. Traditionally, it's a source of warmth, comfort, security, protection from the outside world. But like most other traditions and institutions, the family is changing. First thing is the marriage, I think. But you don't think so. What's important to keep a marriage is to be able to pay the bills to take some of the no, pressures off. No, But the point is, I but have... But the point is, you're sick. And you're neurotic. In our society, marriage is ideally based on love. It is expected that two people will grow together, change together, and complement each other till death do them part. The likelihood that two people will grow and develop at the same rate becomes more and more remote, for rapid change places a heavy burden on the fragile thread of love. Get yourself four other wives, four other mistresses, and be happy, that's all. I'll get myself some lovers and fine. <laughs> I guess it's understandable that the institution of marriage itself is taking on new forms. A woman's face rarely reveals all the changes in her life. Recently, this woman made a controversial choice. She now lives with three men and two women in a group marriage. I feel living in a group marriage situation that you are able to have closer intimacies than you do with just having friendships on the outside because they're more mainly acquaintances. The concept of group marriage is an example of change in society's institutions. It is a result of loneliness in a world of ever more temporary relationships. And as the speed of technological change increases throughout the world, so too will experimentation with new family styles. How are you doing? Hi. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. It makes you realize that you have quite a bit to offer when more than one person cares for you. And you have a tendency to discover, much to your amazement, that you can love very, very much more than one person. Not equally, but in different ways. But you can really learn to care for other people. There are thousands of homes like this in every part of the United States where couples are sharing their lives. Unfortunately, they have to be surreptitious about it. They don't dare tell their friends or neighbors. Robert Rimmer and his wife of 30 years. He is a leading exponent of group marriage and has written influential books on the subject like The Herod Experiment and Proposition 31. I have suggested group marriages is under the name corporate marriage and I think what would happen if there was a legal form of group marriage or even bigamous marriage available, many people would immediately attempt it. A middle class neighborhood in suburbia, USA. It could be anywhere. Germany, England, Sweden. It's a commune. 23 people, married and single. A different kind of family. Well, it was a hassle. Uh, I've been electrical engineer, ex-technical writer. I've been married several times. I had a family, houses. It got to be a drag. I like it much better here. This is, a, for me, a great way to live, relating to people. It's a family. It's much, a much better way than what I've been into for the last 15 years. On mountaintops, in deserts, in sparsely populated areas around the world, young people seek escape from the hectic overstimulation of a high-speed society, forming primitive communes like this. They reject today by returning to yesterday. And here, 
yet another kind of marriage. Tom, do you have a ring for Don? Would you place it on his finger and repeat after me? With this ring, I thee wed. With this ring, I thee wed. For as much as our brothers, Tom and Donald, have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God in this company, and thereunto have given and pledged their troth each to the other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving a ring, and by joining hands, I pronounce that they are married. Amen. The setting for a quiet revolution. Part of a larger revolution affecting all our institutions, religion, education. The factory like school is under attack. Education is in the midst of revolution and like most institutions, the result is change. As public institutions change, so do accepted standards. During the past nine years, I've been a theater manager. And during the last three years, since the enactment of the motion picture rating system, we have found that X-rated films are very popular with our audience and very profitable to us. As a matter of fact, I've been arrested three times for allegedly exhibiting obscene films. I'll, I'll show anything that uh, uh, the public wants to see. If they want to see pornographic films, fine. If not, uh, we'll show whatever they want to see. Civil servants, teachers, and even policemen on strike. Another shockwave to absorb. The foundations of the old society crumble. Women strive for equal rights in numbers never seen before. The rejection of roles which have been dictated by tradition. The right to lead an independent life. Symptoms of a society that is cracking under the pressures for change. What was private is now public. What was condemned now strives for acceptance. The symptoms of society's breakdown erupt on a worldwide scale. We are living through one of the greatest revolutions in history, the birth of a new civilization. Collective protests shatter the structure of the old. Changes bombard our minds and bodies. We become confused, helpless, unable to cope. We all live in turbulence often silent person. The result is the same, stress. In 1969, it was reported that a doctor, A. Nafak of the Soviet Academy of Science had predicted that uh, the world would soon see a genetic equivalent of an arms race, that the world powers would soon develop genetic engineering capable of uh, increasing the output of geniuses. Criticized for such an outlandish and horrifying speculation, he replied merely that the advance of science is and ought to be unstoppable. Not everyone, of course, would agree with that statement. Think of the consequences. Genetics, computers, space, racing blindly ahead, causing the pressures of future shock to intensify. Scientists themselves are concerned. Psychobiologist James McGaw. It's not now possible to produce the same kind of changes in memory that we've, uh, in humans, that we've produced in animals. Uh, such experiments are probably just around the corner. And whether the procedures are the same or different from the ones that we use, it seems clear that within a very few years, it will be possible to change memory processes in human beings through the use of drugs and electrical stimulation. Let's look forward to a period, a number of years from now, Perhaps when a uh, person gets up in the morning and has to take the, the drug to bring his IQ up to the appropriate level, slap on the battery pack so that whenever he gets depressed, he can uh, press a lever and turn on electrical stimulation, which uh, delights him a little bit, and find then that it's not just that he can do these things, which is uh, 
enough to uh, understand, but that he does do these things. Not that it's possible to gain control over intellectual functioning, but in fact that we have. And this person then, perhaps an entire society, will be seen as a victim of the success of biotechnology. Uh, that is to say that he no longer can exercise the choice to take the drug or put on the battery pack or whatever, but he's lost that choice simply because of the su subtle and pervasive increase in the tendency to use it. Technology and science altering behavior, extending our control over mind and body. We wire the animal, we wire the human, and with every new step, the consequences for human life become magnified. The secret of life itself, the DNA molecule, a genetic discovery that could give man the ability to create life to specifications. With it comes the power to change evolution itself. Never have we had such opportunity, or such awesome responsibility. The DNA molecule might very well turn out to be the most important discovery in the whole history of medical science. Not only is it possible to create life, but to recreate it. Considering present scientific knowledge, we may soon be able to create carbon copies of human beings. Imagine the implications to duplicate a human being genetically down to the last detail. Cryonics. There is experimentation now with the possibility that a body might be frozen and revived. If the frozen traveler awakes, what will he find? The advance of science tempts us to speculate on the nature of the world which lies ahead. And the frozen time traveler, like all of us, looks to tomorrow with hope for a better life, a better world. Since time immemorial, we have produced fanciful images about future life. Imagine cities of tomorrow, urban centers, the megalopolis, a vista of towers, traffic, and computer-controlled planning. The spaceport. Looking to the day when space travel is routine. When gleaming, elegant rocket ships carry us smoothly to new worlds. Naive images of cities, space travel, and other wonders may fascinate us for a time, but they may also mislead. Will the frozen time traveler wake up in a very different future? Is a future coming toward us that could shatter all our dreams? The future has burst upon us. The supersonic transport is subject of worldwide debate, forcing the question, is technology always desirable? Changes bombard our nervous systems, clamoring for decisions. New values, new technologies flood into our lives. The pressure of fast change forces us to question all we have been taught. Sometimes technology can destroy an underground nuclear explosion. Amchitka, when will the next nuclear blast occur? And what will it do to us? Escape from change in today's society becomes more and more impossible. Change is necessary, but change itself is out of control. That is the challenge posed by future shock. To look deeply and clearly into today's world, to understand the consequences that what we do today determines what tomorrow will be.
The impact of future shock does not depend on the nature of its victims. They are everywhere. But everywhere in modern technological society, there are those who recognize the dangers and are turning toward the future. <laughs> The future need not be blindly accepted. Author Alvin Toffler finds this conviction spreading among young people throughout the world. If we can recognize that industrialism is not the only possible form of technological society, if we can begin to think more imaginatively about the future, then we can prevent future shock and we can use technology itself to build a decent, democratic and humane society. Well, don't you think education should um, make people aware of the danger of technology instead of making them adapt more easily to any kind of progress and technology and uh, absolutely absolutely that, that that we can no longer uh, allow technology just to come roaring down at us i think we must begin to say no to certain kinds of technology and to begin to control technological change because we've now reached the point at which the technology is so powerful and is so rapid that it could destroy us unless we control it but what's most important is that we do not simply attempt to act that we simply do not accept everything that we begin to make uh, critical decisions about what kind of world we want and what kind of technology we want our children will we save them from future shock or are they destined to suffer the same illness that rocks today's society? The directions we choose have consequences not merely for us. The choices we make will determine the nature of their world. There is still time.